Ever wonder what it'd be like to grow up in the ocean? It's a place where the odds of survival are not very good. Hi, I'm Peter Schremer, and I'm about to take you on an expedition to a special place, a kind of ocean nursery, where little creatures like this have a better chance to survive. This little guy is a young, spiny lobster. And this is an adult. It weighs about nine pounds. It's not easy to get from this to this. In fact, only one in 20,000 lobsters makes it to adulthood. So come with me as I join some Smithsonian scientists who are studying the tiny creatures at the bottom of the food chain. The special ocean nursery that we're exploring is Florida's Indian River Lagoon. Stretching 156 miles along Florida's Atlantic coast, the lagoon is a narrow body of water with the mainland on one side and a long chain of barrier islands on the other. It's a vast outdoor laboratory for studying wildlife, especially the early life of ocean creatures. Mary Rice has spent most of her career deciphering the lagoon's secrets. It's an ideal spot for studies of biodiversity. Couldn't be better. There's a big world out there that uh, most people don't know anything about. That's why Mary founded this research station on the lagoon's shores in 1998. Each year, more than 100 scientists and students come to it to study the abundance of creatures that are found in the lagoon. James Douglas is part of a new generation of biologists who have taken up the quest to find the keys to survival in this obscure world. You might think that scientists know everything about a place like the Indian River Lagoon, but in fact, we know very little. And there's so much left to know, simple things like, what does this animal eat? Uh, what eats it? The lagoon is a natural nursery for marine animals because it's a biological crossroads. Fresh water from rivers meets salt water that flows in from the sea through inlets. Inlets are like ocean highways. Every day is rush hour as tens of millions of tiny creatures travel in and out of the lagoon on the tides. This makes it a great place to start our exploration of life in the food chain. I'm here with biologist Michael Boyle, who's going to sample what's down there with this net, which is designed for sampling plankton. Here you go, Mike. Thanks, Peter. We're aboard the research vessel Sunburst, right here in the Fort Pierce Inlet. It's one of only five places that connects the lagoon to the open ocean. We're going to begin at the very bottom with life in its most fundamental form, the larval stage. Many ocean creatures start life as very tiny larvae, released among the plankton the name we give to everything that floats on the ocean currents. Most people think of plankton as simply food for larger animals, but its greater purpose is dispersing life around the oceans. The vast majority of the different types of animals on our planet live in the ocean. Their offspring get around and the species move about the planet in the marine habitat by having dispersal forms. Planktonic larvae use different forms of locomotion to move around the oceans. Some are equipped with revolving propellers like microscopic aircraft. Others have wings. So the adults send their offspring, their juveniles, their larvae out into the water and they move around the planet. They find new habitat, they find new food, they extend the species in different geographical locations. By pulling the net through the water at various depths, Mike can catch all kinds of different creatures in their tiny larval forms. Some might have begun their journey as far away as the coast of Africa, taking months to cross the ocean. Others may have been born in the lagoon just weeks ago and floated offshore on the tide. The net scoops them up in all their diversity. What's in each one of these, you don't know until you bring it back. In a bucket full of seawater, we get what looks like water with a bunch of little dots in it. Things start swimming around. 
It's kind of hard to see everything that's in here with the naked eye. So what do you say we head back to Mike's lab where we can take a closer look? Take a look at this, Peter. Cool. It's commonly known that the oceans cover two-thirds of the planet with water. But who would guess at all the amazing life you can find in just a small bowl of it? All of a sudden, that little bowl full of water becomes alive. And there may be 10,000 different organisms in here. We're talking about the ones you can see, not the bacteria, the microbes, uh, the plankton. There's so much life here that scientists are still trying to discover what some of them will grow up to become. It's a very bizarre world and very fascinating world. They almost look like aliens from outer space. If any of these creatures look familiar, it's because for years filmmakers have been using ocean life to create aliens from outer space in their movies and TV shows. They're actually aliens from aqua space is what I call them. Huge part of the unknown. They are just uh, spectacular in their form and in their behavior, in their diversity of form, really in their aesthetic appeal. <laughs> The babies of many animals, including humans, look recognizably similar to the corresponding adults. Not so in aqua space. The larvae can be very different from the adult. Trying to figure out which larvae will turn into which adult can be a guessing game. In this field, Mary Rice is the ultimate sleuth. What do you think this one will grow into? This one is a snail. You can see the shell, which will be retained at metamorphosis. And this guy? You'll never guess what this is. This is the larva of a conch. We're making new shell. <laughs> and this? This is a clam larva. This one's a lot easier. It's a starfish, otherwise known as a sea star. This is a tough one. You're guessing a shrimp, maybe? But no, these pincers he's growing are a clue. Yep, he's a crab. Well, this one's not hard to guess. It's our old friend, the lobster. In its larval form, the lobster is easy prey for plankton-eating fish. But as it metamorphoses through the stages of its early life cycle, it increases its chances for survival if it can make it into the lagoon on the incoming tides. Some mysterious natural signal tells the infant to drop from the open water into the seagrass that grows on much of the lagoon bottom. Here, it is sheltered from predators while it grows into a juvenile. Then it makes its way back out to the ocean to make a home on the rocky reefs near the shore and to find a mate with whom to begin the cycle of life over again. Only 50 out of every million survive this journey. It's not just lobsters. Nearly two thirds of the seafood we catch to eat spend some part of their lives growing up in lagoons and estuaries. 